All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms and families and homes around the world. We know it's strange times, so we always love the opportunity to highlight amazing explorers and scientists from across the globe. Today is really exciting because today marks the beginning of a really fantastic partnership with the Arctic Institute of North America at the University of Calgary. They are Canada's first and longest lived Arctic Research Institute and over the coming months we'll be sharing a whole bevy of amazing stories with some of their staff, faculty and people from across the globe live in Calgary and from across Canada. Today's talk is very special and it's a really exciting opportunity to highlight a really iconic figure in Arctic exploration. So we are joined live by Genevieve Lemoyne and she is coming into us from the uh, Arctic Museum and Arctic Study Centre at Baudouin College where she is the curator and registrar of the Perry Macmillan Arctic Museum and, and Arctic uh, Study Centre. So Jenny is going to talk today about Donald Macmillan and the changing Arctic, uh, highlighting a really iconic and, and fascinating time in Arctic exploration history. So I'm really excited to dive in with a talk and I just wanted to note a couple things before we get started. First of all, I mentioned the Arctic Institute of North America, and if you check the bottom of your screen, we've got a banner there now where you can learn more about all the amazing work that they're doing, so do check that out. And secondly, if you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, either on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants channels or Arctic Institute channels, share your questions in the chat bar. We'd love to see where you're joining from from around the globe. Uh, let us know, and we'll share as many questions as we can at the end with Genevieve. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, take us away. Can't wait to hear your story. Hi, thanks, Jesse, and thanks to the Arctic Institute. It's really exciting to be the, the first speaker in this uh, new collaboration. And it's maybe appropriate that I'm talking about Macmillan because he had some pretty important firsts and teaching and reaching out to classrooms and people around the world was one of his um, great joys and one of the most important things he did. I should start off by asking who is Macmillan? I'm guessing that a lot of people here don't know who he is, although a hundred years ago he was very famous. This is a, a poster advertising one of his many, many talks. This is from 1926 and all it says is, hey, Macmillan is coming. And you knew who Macmillan was in those days. Um, when he wasn't in the Arctic exploring and doing research, he was crisscrossing the country, giving hundreds of lectures a year, showing photographs and motion picture films. He made a good living doing that um, in those years. But how did he get famous and why isn't he famous anymore? Um, that's what I'll be talking about. I'll be talking about how he worked in the Arctic, um, the changes he saw in the Arctic during his career and, and what that meant to the kind of work he did and his legacy today. A little bit of background on Macmillan. Uh, he was born in 1874 in Provincetown, Massachusetts at the very tip of Cape Cod. Uh, but his father, who was a ship captain, was originally from Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. Uh, his father was a fisher, a fisherman. He captained fishing ships uh, sailing often into the north as far as Greenland. And in fact, he died when his ship went down with all hands off Labrador uh, when Macmillan was only nine years old. His mother then died three years later. And after a few years of uh, staying with different families in Provincetown, Macmillan moved to Freeport, Maine, which is about eight miles from where I am here in Brunswick, Maine. Uh, he lived with his sister and her husband there and he went to high school and being so close to Bowdoin College, although as a, a younger man, he had never really, nobody in his family had considered going to college. His high school principal convinced him that he should enroll at Bowdoin College and, and get a, a bit of higher education. So he did. Uh, he graduated from Bowdoin College in 1898. Um, and then he became a teacher, as a lot of college graduates do. Here he is in his football gear. Uh, he taught classics and physical education at different schools. This is at Swarthmore Preparatory School in Pennsylvania. He later taught at Worcester Academy um, in Massachusetts. He was always great at sports. He taught, he coached football, he did gymnastics, he did races, he did swimming. He wasn't a very big guy, but he was a very strong guy. And he had a very good career as a teacher at these uh, private schools in the United States on the East Coast. He also loved the sea. He was um, obviously from a seafaring family and he grew up 
imagining that he would actually go to sea when he grew up rather than becoming a teacher. Uh, as a substitute for that, in the summers when he wasn't teaching, he operated a boys camp uh, called Camp Witchmere on Buston's Island, which is in Casco Bay, just off from Freeport in Maine. Uh, and it was a very successful camp. The boys had a great time sailing, learning how to sail, going on hikes and doing all those kinds of camping things. Um, he had some pretty well-known uh, campers at his camp, including Cole Porter, if you're a music fan. Uh, as a young man, Cole Porter learned to sail from Donald McMillan. And also Robert Peary Jr. Robert Peary Jr. was a son of Robert Peary, obviously, who was a very famous Arctic explorer at that time, who had his summer home also in Casco Bay on Eagle Island in Maine, um, and who had also graduated from Bowdoin College. So Macmillan and Robert Peary had a little bit of a connection. Macmillan taught, he, I said he graduated in 1898, he taught for about 10 years, and then in 1908, a big change came into his life. Robert Peary, who you see here looking kind of haggard and worn in his polar clothing, invited Macmillan to join him on his final expedition to try and reach the North Pole in 1908. Um, he, had, he knew Macmillan from slightly from the fact that his son had attended his camp and Macmillan had actually been in the newspapers because he rescued two separate groups of people who ships had, who sailboats had capsized in the bay and he'd rescued them from drowning. So Macmillan was just exactly the kind of person that Peary thought would be good as a member of his expedition. So he got a leave of absence for, from his teaching position and in the summer of 1908, he sailed with Peary and a other, group of other men aboard the schooner Roosevelt, sorry, I'm gesturing to this, but here it is, the, the schooner Roosevelt, which was Peary's ship, which they sailed north to Cape Sheridan, the northeast corner of Ellesmere Island, where they froze the ship in, as you can see here, and used it as a base for trying to get to the North Pole. For the purposes of this story, it doesn't matter whether Peary got to the pole or not. It's a huge controversy, but it doesn't really matter. Macmillan knew that his job on the expedition was not for him personally to get to the North Pole. He and all the other men on the expedition were there as support people to help Peary get there. Um, but still, he did expect and he got a great adventure. Here you can see him. This is him here in the middle holding the snowshoes. He's sitting with George Borup, who's holding the rifle on one side, and Kyota, an Inuit man from Northern Greenland on the other side. They are standing at a cairn that Peary built at Cape Morris Jessup, which is as far north as you can go on land in Greenland. Um, you can see on this map, Cape Sheridan is here, right near the Canadian Forces Base Alert, which wasn't there at the time, of course. Um, Cape Morris Jessup is way up here on northern, er, northern Greenland. And they, with three other Inuit men, had sledged in the spring of 1909 after the North Pole, their part in the actually getting to the North Pole was done. They'd sledged up there. Um, their goal while they were there was to take tidal readings. So they were measuring the tide, the, the, the amount of the ebb and flow of the tide that far north. And they were also intending to sledge out onto the Arctic Ocean, measuring the depth of the ocean bed as they went. Um, so they were doing science, gathering data in far northern Greenland. Um, I'm losing my place here. Macmillan, when he later wrote about that trip, he described it as having the time of their lives. You can see they look pretty relaxed there. They're pretty happy, even though they're you know, as far north on land as you can get in the Arctic. Um, in the past, in the, in the 1900s, men had died trying to get where they were. And here they were, two young guys who had never been to the Arctic before until that time, and they had no trouble at all. Peary had taught them that if they learned from the Inuit how to survive on the land, these kinds of long journeys and living out on the land would be not only safe, but actually even fun. 
Macmillan learned that lesson really well. Um, here you can see they are having fun. Uh, one of the things they did while they were up there were they hunted some muskox and here they've used parts of the skins to make pseudo bearskin hats like the, the Royal Grenadiers in England. And so they're being an honor guard uh, for Borup to take a picture of them. They, they did a certain amount of horsing around and having fun as among the science and other uh, serious work that they were doing. But Macmillan and Borup actually both fell in love with the Arctic. They really enjoyed working with the men that they were working with. They loved being there, they loved traveling. Um, and they both really, really wanted to have a career as an Arctic explorer. Uh, the North Pole expedition that they were on, the primary goal was geographic exploration. Although they did also do some science as well, mostly the kind of collecting tidal data that I talked about for the Coast and Geodetic Survey, the federal government department. But finding the North Pole was really one of the last bits of traditional exploration that was left to be done in the Arctic. It was the end of a major era of Arctic exploration even though there was finding it didn't really mean anything and there was nothing there. It just, it marked the end of an era. And yet here was Macmillan on his first trip to the Arctic and he wants to make a career as an Arctic explorer, but what is there left to explore? In fact, there was one place. Um, Peary in 1906 had been, this is a map of, here you can see Ellesmere Island. If you're familiar with the, the Arctic, this is Axel Heiberg Island, this is the Arctic Ocean. Peary standing here in 1906 had thought he could see land out here. And in fact, tidal data from around the Arctic collected by expeditions like this and, and those that went before it suggested that there was a piece of undiscovered land in the Arctic Ocean. So Macmillan and George Borup set out to test whether it was really there or not. Um, in the end, Borup unfortunately drowned in a canoeing accident before the expedition could leave. So Macmillan ran the expedition as the sole leader. But by then, as I've said, geographic exploration was really no longer a big enough deal to fund a whole major expedition. They're just, people weren't willing to pay for just geographic exploration when the, the, the outcome of it was so unlikely and really wasn't expected to have a big impact. Really, you needed to be doing science as the primary reason for such a trip to get to get the kind of funding that they would need. And so they turned to science. They, uh, Borup was actually a, uh, in graduate school for geology. Macmillan was in graduate school for anthropology. They got support from the American Museum of Natural History, from the American Geographical Society, and from the University of Illinois. And with and other private funders, a few private funders, um, and with that money, Macmillan and six other men headed north to do two years of scientific research in the Arctic along, and as a part of that, they would make a big sledge expedition out onto the Arctic Ocean to see if they could find Crocker land. And of course, if they got there, they had plans to collect scientific data there as well. They left in the summer of 1913. They set up a their research base at Etah in Northern Greenland. Um, you can see on this map, Etah just barely makes it into it. This is the, the very far westernmost part of Greenland here. So that's where they set up their house. They called it Borup Lodge in honor of uh, the recently deceased George Borup. Um, and they settled in to do a lot of science. There, there was a botanist, a zoologist. Um, they were doing geo, supposed to do geophysical research anthropological research, lots and lots of different studies planned. Um, they got themselves settled in, they built themselves a nice house. Here they are at their first Christmas in 1913. These are all the American members of the expedition, um, except Macmillan who's taking the picture. And this young man here, his name is uh, Minnick Wallace. Uh, he was born in North Greenland. Peary brought him and his family to New York. It's a whole nother story, but he had made his way back to Greenland and he was working for the expedition as an interpreter. Um, so here they are celebrating Christmas. They have electric light. Uh, they have a nice warm house. Uh, it was really, it was uh, quite, a, quite a setup that they had managed. Um, in the spring of 1914, after Macmillan had 
as he had been trained by Peary, he trained these men to travel on the land and to wear traditional Inuit clothing and drive dog teams. Uh, he, after some mishaps, and he and a small group went out on a long sledging trip out on the Arctic expedition or Arctic Ocean to try and get to Crocker Land. Here you can see them standing on a, the tip of a pressure ridge looking to see what they can see. And sadly, what they saw, they first thought they did indeed see Crocker Land, but they soon realized one of the Inuit men said when looking at it, he said, it's moving. And in fact, what they were looking at was a mirage, a fairly common kind of mirage in that area, but a mirage nonetheless. There was no island out there to be seen. So they went back, they continued their scientific research, but because they hadn't found Crocker Land, the expedition was really widely regarded, and it still today is regarded in a lot of places as a failure. It kind of ignores the fact that they did in fact do a lot of science. They collected weather data, tidal data, they made soundings, uh, mapping the ocean floor. Um, and if those sound familiar, those are still all kinds of data that are still collected in the Arctic. When you look at um, where Canada is still, all the countries in the Arctic are still mapping the ocean floor to make their claims um, to, the, to the seabed. And we're still collecting weather data, of course, these days it's even more important. And they did other research as well. Um, here you can see, for example, this is recognizably hard traditional science. Um, Elmer Ekblaw, who was, among other things, the botanist for the expedition and certainly by far the most productive scientist on the expedition. He did a lot of these kinds of studies where he would lay out a plot on the ground about a yard square, map all the different plants in it, and record blooming times, how long the blooms lasted, a, a kind of a study called phenology. Um, and this kind of data today is still important as we look at climate change and phenology is changing in the Arctic. So they did some good and useful science. They collected lots of zoological specimens. Um, they did some archeology, span important archeology. span um, They did a lot of work and a number of publications came out of that work. Macmillan did some of this scientific work, mostly what his interest was, uh, was in the people, in the anthropology, as I said, he was he had been in a graduate program for anthropology. He was documenting the language, the technology, and the everyday activities of the Inuit families that they interacted with. Now, we saw at the beginning a lecture poster from 1926. Macmillan, in fact, had started lecturing um, in 1909, right after he got back from the North Pole expedition. There was a great demand for information about the Arctic and uh, lectures and uh, about the about the Arctic were hugely popular. He already knew then from that experience that photographs, good photography was really an important part. People wanted to see, not just hear about the Arctic. Um, and in 1913, he was also able to bring with him for the first time a motion picture camera. It was not the very first motion picture camera in the Arctic, but one of the very first and some of the very earliest surviving footage. Uh, most of the film he took was, he took about 10,000 feet of motion picture film. Most of it has been lost or destroyed. But a few years ago, we discovered that some of it had been donated to the Library of Congress. Um, and we were managed to get it digitized. Not surprisingly, he had filmed people and activities around the lodge because the camera wasn't very portable. Um, and this, I'm just going to show you this short clip. It's just not even two minutes long. Um, and it's all silent, of course. I'll, I'll describe what's going on. This is uh, a young woman. Her name is Anawi. And she's going hunting for Arctic hare in 1915. You can see their lodge behind them with a lot of other stuff going on there. Um, here is Anawi. She's got the dogs hitched up and she's bringing them out to her sledge. And we know from Macmillan's journal that she had gone out a couple of times already this spring um, trapping Arctic hare. And so Macmillan took the opportunity of her next trip to film it. It was not totally unheard of, but relatively unusual for a woman to go out, especially by herself, hunting like this. And sometimes she stayed overnight, sometimes she was just gone for one day. So here you can see she's going down there at the, on a, in a fjord. She's, she went out and here she is coming back the kids are running out to meet her. The little kid can't quite make it onto the sledge, but the bigger kid gets a ride in. 
um, she comes in and Macmillan comes down and the other women who are at the house come down to greet her. You can see that she's standing on the dog's traces so they can't pull the sled away. And Macmillan is picking up the Arctic hare that she's brought back and the women are gonna carry them up to the house where they will clean them, eat them, cook the meat and uh, use the furs for clothing, for lining boots and things like that. Um, and there they all go up the bank from the sea ice up the shore. And here she is with her gun and her, she, she wasn't shooting the hares as far as I know, she was trapping them, but that's, uh, so in 1913, especially a film like this was really remarkable and a really exciting thing for people to be able to see. Um, so the results of the Crockerland expedition were kind of mixed and things weren't improved by the fact that um, this two year expedition turned into a four year expedition. They couldn't get back for, um, for four years because the ships sent to, to take them home didn't make it or were unable to return. Um, when they got back, it was 1917, World War I was going on. The men were signing up and enlisting as did Macmillan and getting involved in the war. And so it, it didn't really get the attention that a big Arctic expedition might have in earlier years. But still Macmillan was uh, convinced that he could make a living as an explorer, uh, but he wanted to do it on his own terms and he wanted to focus on science. So after the war, he raised money to build his own ship so that he could come and go to the Arctic when he when he wanted to, basically. He didn't, wasn't gonna get stuck in the Arctic ever again. Um, the, the ship is called the Schooner Bowden, was launched in 1921. It's now getting ready to celebrate its 100th anniversary, um, still sailing. And with this kind of a ship, he had the freedom to travel to the Arctic when he wanted to, to go where he wanted to go. He could bring scientists with him safely and he could carry their cumbersome equipment. He could set them up. He could help really facilitate a lot of interesting scientific research. He designed the Bowden to be nimble and strong. Um, he intended to sail north and let her freeze in for the winter to be a base for research. So she had to be able to sustain the pressure of the ice. She had to be able to weave in between ice flows and in through narrow leads in the ice to get where he wanted to go. And she also had to be able to withstand running aground on the rocks as she often did because the, the seafloor, the, the, the coastlines here were not at all well mapped. And so you just never knew when you were gonna bang into a rock, um, which she did frequently ending up like this, but always getting safely into the water again and getting them home. The Bowden was really an all round success. Uh, here you can see her in winter quarters, frozen into the ice. This is in Schooner Harbor near Cape Dorset on Southern Baffin Island, where they spent the first winter, 1921-22. You can see it's all banked with snow. The local Inuit have helped them build igloos over the hatches to help keep the ship warm. And they were doing a lot of research, traveling, they were doing ornithological research. Um, but the funding for this expedition had mostly come from the Carnegie Institute. They were doing geophysical research, measuring the magnetic fields of the earth. And this interesting building, there's, a, there's actually a, a wooden building underneath this, uh, all banked with snow to keep it warm, but this is called the Magnetic Observatory. The Carnegie Institute set, sent up a very delicate instrument which they could use to measure the earth's magnetic fields. And this was part of a global project on the part of the Carnegie Institute um, that Macmillan and his researchers were part of. The next year, they, they came home in 1922 and 1923. He went north again, this time to Greenland, again, doing the same kind of magnetic uh, studies. There's a, can, you can't really see it in this photograph very well. I, I think this is the magnetic observatory here. Um, and here's the ship melting out of the ice in the spring in a place called Refuge Harbor in Northern Greenland. Um, he continued to film on these expeditions. And in fact, one of the main goals of this expedition, this North Greenland expedition, was to film muskox in the wild. Um, I'm not gonna show you that film because you can stream it on the webpage, the film of the muskox. He did successfully film them. Um, 
but you can see this is on the trip to film the muskox. You can see the camera here. It's called an Akeley camera. It was designed specifically to be taken on these kinds of expeditions to film wildlife. Um, there's a, if I have time, there's a, there's a funny story. He had two cameras on this expedition, this Akeley camera and another much, much more expensive camera, which was too bulky to take on a sledging trip, but which was very good for using around camp. And while he was on Ellesmere Island with the Akeley camera filming muskox, the men who were back at the ship and the Inuit who were there with them, they thought it might be a good idea to try filming a walrus hunt with the, the other camera, which was a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, $2,000 at the time, which was a lot of money. Um, so they went out, they took it, they put it on the boat, they went out, they started hunting walrus and the uh, camera fell into the water and it's still there as far as we know. Um, I first heard this story from the daughter of one of the Inuit men who was on that trip and it was, it's a well-known story up there. Macmillan's reaction though was, was good. He got back, he heard what had happened to his very pricey camera and he said, well, it's a good thing I still have this other camera. And he continued to use that Ickley camera for many, many years. And it in fact is now in our collection. Um, he continued to film people and the kinds of things that were going on around him. And I will show you this clip. Um, this is part of the Muskox film, but this shows uh, a sledge repair, as you can see from the intertitle. There, they were on a, a trip in the spring and one of the sledge runners broke. Oops, sorry, there we go. Um, and so he documented how the Inuit fixed, you know, when they're out on the trail, how they would fix a sled. So what they're doing here is they need to lash the runner back together. So they're making the holes with a 22. and checking to make sure that they're good, which they were. Um, they need a little bit of extra reaming out, as you can see. Um, and this is quite remarkable. So they have heavy seal, seal skin line, but they need a finer, a thinner line. And so they cut it in half lengthwise, as you can see. This takes an amazingly steady hand and a very, very sharp knife so that you cut the cord in half. And so yes, here they're going to clamp the runner together. So they've they've put some of the line just around it to, to hold the two pieces together and they're gonna use a tourniquet. You can just see he decided to use, not to use that snow beater, which was too thin. He wanted a heavier, a sturdier piece of wood. So he's using a hatchet handle and they're just twisting it and twisting it at, to create a vise to keep the pieces together. And then they're gonna lash it together. So he was very interested. He, unlike a lot of filmmakers at the time, he wasn't interested in showing Northern people as frozen in the past, so to speak, with only using their traditional technology. He was more interested in showing them using the technology, just doing what they did, whether it was modern technology or traditional technology. Um, but in terms of modern technology, Macmillan also was involved in a lot of firsts. Here you can see, uh, this is a radio operator, Don Mix. In 1923, on this expedition, for the very first time, they successfully used a shortwave radio, which was brand new at that time, to communicate with the South. With the South, They could actually both send and receive radio messages from the United States, particularly from Chicago where Zenith was headquartered. But in fact, I think it was somebody, a kid, a ham radio operator in Nanaimo, I think picked up their first broadcast. Um, and this was a big deal, being able to communicate. They tried radio, on the Crockerland expedition with no success. They tried in 1921 with no success. This was the first time it actually worked. And that was so important um, that Macmillan and Eugene MacDonald, who was president of Zenith Corporation, who had convinced him to try the radio to begin with, they convinced the Navy that they would should do a demonstration of the success of radio broadcast from the Arctic for the Navy. 
and they should also test the use of airplanes in the Arctic. So the Navy agreed, and in 1925, they took the Bowden, schooner Bowden North. The Navy combined their expedition with one that uh, Richard Byrd had proposed to also try airplanes. So they had two ships, the Bowden, a new ship called the Peary to carry the airplanes. They went to Etah, they tried the airplanes, um, which worked pretty much. They flew these um, amphibious planes, they took them off from the water. Uh, and they, they worked pretty well. They had a lot of problems with the weather and they had problems with more ice in the fjord than they had anticipated. It was a just a different year from the other years McMillan had been up there. Um, but they did show that aircraft could successfully take off and land in the Arctic. They didn't, they had hoped kind of to get to the North Pole with the planes, they didn't manage that. Although Bird would again go back by himself the next year and at least claim to have done it. Um, but you know, here you can see the little plane taking off, flying over the Bowdoin, off towards Ellesmere Island. Um, anybody who's flown in the Arctic is totally aware of how much the weather is controlling, in control of your flights, even today. And so it's not surprising that it was only a moderate success. The radio, on the other hand, was a huge success. Here is a group of Inuit men and women, a choir, um, who are going to sing a song their very first ever radio broadcast. They're in the mess of the, the SS Peary. This is Eugene McDonald and Donald McMillan. And so they're broadcasting and the Navy is listening. And in fact, it, this broadcast was picked up all over the place, including really remarkably in Tasmania, South Australia. So Eugene McDonald was thrilled. They had demonstrated to the Navy that shortwave radio worked and they could communicate much, much more easily. And it really was the importance of radio in the Arctic for Arctic communications is really, really amazing. McMillan continued to test new technology. Here he is, his final overwintering expedition with the Bowdoin was in 1927-28, and I can see a typo in my caption there. Um, and there he had a Model T Ford truck with a kit. This was a commercially available kit that turned it into a snowmobile. This was the first snowmobile along the Labrador coast. Um, and it was a big hit. Uh, they used it to take the doctor to see patients, to move supplies around, wood and other supplies, to visit people up and down the coast, to give them rides on their first ever snowmobile rides. Um, it didn't have a huge impact. Snowmobiles, of course, later became very important, but the Model T was not really cut out for this kind of work, and it didn't uh, it didn't get much use. Macmillan left it there, but it didn't get much use. It has recently, and if you're interested and you want to put a note in the chat or something like that, I can send you links. It has recently been fully restored and is now running again, which is very exciting. It's in Maine, Labrador, and the people there are very excited about it. Um, Technology wasn't the only focus of the expedition, of course. It was sponsored by the Field Museum of Chicago, and they had sent a number of scientists, um, a botanist, a zoologist, an ichthyologist, a geologist, and an anthropologist, Duncan Strong, who you see here, um, who worked with local Innu families and, and published a, uh, a report on his work there. That was the last big, major overwintering expedition that Macmillan supervised or sponsored in a sense. Um, but he continued to work in the Arctic. He went summer after summer in the schooner Bowdoin, bringing scientists into the field. He ran a mapping expedition. This is an, another aerial expedition where they were mapping the coast of Labrador, which was at that time very poorly mapped. Um, he brought scientists into the field often getting them to places where they wouldn't otherwise get. So this is um, an ornithologist Alfred Gross, who was a professor actually at Bowdoin College, with some of his students and other associates um, there to do ornithology on Button Island at the very, very northern tip of Labrador, where it would be really almost impossible. It is impossible to get there without a boat or these days a helicopter, but Macmillan could get them there. He dropped them off, they did their work, he, and he went on to do other things and he picked them up on the way back. Um, he continued to document his work with film this is a little bit of color film, actually, from 1939. Um, and here you, you could just get a glimpse of the iceberg. McMillan has sailed the Bowdoin up 
a fjord. They're at, I think, the Umiako Glacier on West Greenland, up a, an ice-filled fjord, and he's bringing the Bowden right up to the cliffs of the fjord. These young men are jumping off, and they're going to climb up to the plateau, um, carrying their equipment up, including a transit. And what they're going to do is measure the speed of an advancing glacier. Um, here they are setting up their tent. Um, and you don't really get a sense right there of how high up they are. This is Chauncey Waldron. He was the, the sort of leader of this research. Um, he was from the New England Natural History Museum, I believe. There, it's hard to see because the film, the quality of the film is not great. This is the very rough surface of the leading edge of the glacier, which is constantly dropping ice into this fjord. Makes it a very dangerous place to have the Bowden. But Macmillan, he was a bit of a risk taker. And here you can see from the camp down. This is the schooner Bowden. This is how I, how high up they are, um, and that kind of really exemplifies the kind of the advantage of a ship like this, it could get, with a captain like McMillan at least, it could get into places, go places that other research vessels wouldn't be able to manage. It was an amazing, uh, an amazing ship and he was so skilled um, that he could do things that other people couldn't. And that was, you know, an important, an important advantage that he had. The work, all that work was interrupted by the Second World War, of course. The Navy, the US Navy bought the Bowdoin from Macmillan at the beginning of the war and they used it to do mapping in Greenland. They mapped um, Sonderstrom Fjord with the schooner Bowdoin and did other projects. Uh, while Macmillan did uh, more work for out of Washington, he was identifying places to establish bases in Greenland and making a, a dictionary for the American forces in Greenland to be able to communicate with local populations and things like that. Um, but after the war, he tried to pick up where he'd left off, uh, bringing people into the field. More and more, he was bringing individual scientists. Here you can see um, Bill Powers, who was a, a geologist, a glaciologist, um, coming into the field. More and more often, though, he was bringing students, many, many students. By this time, um, the funding situation had changed again. It was harder, I think, for him to get um, to fully fund an expedition as he had done in the 20s and even in the 30s with scientific research. So he was going north, bringing young men to train them in sailing and Arctic research and science and things like that. And they, were, they went, they paid for the privilege. So he was at least in part funding his expeditions, his trips north with paying students. Um, and he had great success at it. He trained a lot of young men, um, many of them went on to important careers, some of them even in Arctic research. This is, if there's anthropologists in the audience, this is Tiger Birch, who um, was a very, very well-respected anthropologist working in Alaska. And his first experience in the Arctic was aboard the schooner Bowden when he was only 16, I think. Um, he told us he was really glad when they were taking this, there's also motion picture film of, the, of him playing the accordion. He was very glad there was no sound because he was just learning to play the accordion. But it was his first Arctic experience and Macmillan was um, quite influential uh, in, in the very, very beginnings of his interest in, in the Arctic, which went on to become so important. Um, they did continue to, tr to try some new technologies. This is the Bowdoin in Northern Greenland with lots of local Inuit people aboard. This is Miriam McMillan standing there. She's operating a wire recorder, which used really, really thin uh, stainless steel wire to record sound. And this is in the 1940s. It was a very short lived technology, but it was the best way to get sound portable recording of sound in those days. And I'll just play you if you can hear it. Uh, um, 
So that is, uh, unfortunately, we don't know who it is. One of the one of the men, um, one of McMillan's friends in the Arctic, um, he was improvising that song. It's a it's a kind of song called an ay ya ya song. You could hear at the at intervals. He would say ay ya ya, and that's a it's kind of like la la la, um, but it's an important part of uh, of music, vocal music in this area. Um, but the song is welcoming the McMillans back to the Arctic, back to their community. Um, and he was just making it up as he was going along, improvising it. Um, and so they made a number of recordings uh, and things like that. Oh, 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 oh. No, stop, there it is. But more and more as the years went on, the trips, actual, what we would think of as, as real science became less and less important. He was returning to communities that he visited again and again over the years. And so he was visiting old friends. Um, he always had a doctor with him and the doctor always provided medical care. Often in these remoter communities, there was, it was very rare that a doctor would appear. So um, people were glad to see the doctor, sometimes a dentist even. Um, and he had some, some reunions with old friends. These, these three women, uh, Tukamek, Ivalu and Inuahu, they were all seamstresses on the North Pole expedition. So McMillan had known them for about 40 years at this point, um, and they were glad to see him. When I was working in these communities, talking to people about McMillan, uh, it was clear that in the 1940s and in the 1950s, when he came, you know, when the schooner Bowden showed up, people were excited. They they ran down to meet him. He was an old friend. He, you know. He spoke their language. They apparently teased him about his bad accent, but still he spoke their language. Um, and, and he was really liked here in Labrador. When we've talked to people in Labrador, uh, people rarely have a bad thing to say about him, which is not true of all explorers or all the researchers that go into these communities. Um, but, you know, so they were becoming in a, they weren't exactly pleasure cruises, but neither were they scientific expeditions anymore by the 1950s. McMillan's last expedition was in 1954 when he was 80 years old. Um, and at this point, things had really, really changed. I mean, he had been witnessing these changes. And in fact, because he'd been involved with the military during the Second World War, he'd been part of some of these changes. But when he went in 1950, but between his trip in 1950, his second last trip, and then his last trip in 1954, things had really changed. This photograph is taken near the community of Umanak uh, in West Greenland, and so is this picture. The American military built the Thule Air Base right by the Inuit community of Umanak, um, and so where there had once been a beautiful little Inuit village. Now there were thousands and thousands of American servicemen living and big transport vessel vessels. This is the US Coast Guard cutter West Wind with the Bowdoin tied up alongside it, dwarfed by this massive ship. Um, they were all thrilled to have Macmillan there, but it had to have been very, very almost bittersweet for him to see the dramatic changes to what um, you know, people described before the construction of the Thule Air Base, people described this particular area of the coastline to me as, a, as really a paradise. Um, and it was, has been really forever changed. The community there, in fact, had been forced to move about 100 miles north to a place called Hanak. And here, just to, to close the full circle on Macmillan's experiences in the, uh, in the Arctic, this is Uta who was one of the men who stood with Peary at the North Pole. So again, like the three women you saw before, Macmillan had known him for 19, since 1908. Um, he was one of the most respected hunters in his community. He was in fact, one of the very few people who spoke up against the forced relocation of the community. Although sadly, he was ignored by the Danish and American authorities. Um, and so here he is standing in his, the little house they were provided with these small wooden drafty houses by the Danish government. Um, and so between them, between Macmillan and, and Oda, Uta, they had witnessed really, really dramatic changes, both in the, the social and economic circumstances of the communities, 
in the technology that they had access to or had imposed upon them. Um, and from Macmillan's point of view, in the way that science was done. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it was becoming a very, very different world. Macmillan was obviously at this point old enough that he really didn't need to or want to continue doing scientific research um, or sponsoring expeditions. He was, he was ready to retire at this point, but he'd come to a point where the kind of work he did in the Arctic wasn't really um, up to snuff for the scientific community anymore. Um, in fact, this is a, a photograph also from our collection. This is a, a Bowdoin graduate, Spencer Apollonio, who just three years after that picture in 1954, so this is 1957, and he's on Ice Island, Fletcher's Ice Island, also known as T3, where in 1952, a long-term scientific research station had been established. And that kind of big science, a lot of science at this point in the United States, sponsored by the US military, coming out of their experiences in the Second World War, but also um, you know, scientists interested in climate and geophysics and all kinds of things going on in a way that was a step beyond the kind of, of research that Macmillan could support with his little schooner Bowdoin. So things were really changing. Um, so what is his legacy? This is, this is a photograph of him from that 1924 muskox film where they captured a baby muskox. And if you go onto our website and watch the film, you can see, see the baby uh, in motion. Um, for us at the museum, I think we feel strongly that his biggest legacy is the, the photography and the motion picture film he took of those communities that he visited over and over and over again. Um, that kind of documentation by the same person of the same communities is really rare in anthropology, in certainly in the Arctic. Um, and that makes it really valuable. And it, its value, I think, lies mostly in the communities. For us, we can study it as anthropologists and historians, and we can learn quite a lot from it. But it doesn't really compare to what happens when you go back to the communities and make it available, make these resources available to them. So this is from 1999, when before digitizing photographs was a big deal. We took physical copies of photographs from this community. This is in Hanak, so from Northern Greenland back there, um, and talked to people about them and left these copies of the photographs with them. And this is Ole Peterson and his cousin, Enadliak Mitek. And they're looking at pictures of themselves as babies that Macmillan took in 1924. Their parents worked with him at Refuge Harbor uh, on that expedition. And they were both born during those years. Ole was actually baptized on board the schooner Bowdoin. He really, really wanted the Bowdoin to come back so that he could see it again, but they have not managed to sail it that far, far north for many, many years. Um, so there's a lot of value for, for the local communities in these photographs. And I would say the most important thing I think that we're doing right now is working to make them accessible to these communities. They've been here on paper for many, many, many years, but now of course we can make digital versions available to them and people can work with them themselves. Um, here you see Joanna Piwataluk, Piwataluk, sorry, I can't, I'm mispronouncing her name, um, holding a photograph of herself taken by Macmillan when she was a child in a pond inlet. Um, this is in 2002. And the work that was done by Anne Henshaw and Pond Inlet led to the production of um, a video by uh, Mikai Utavav, a young woman from Pond Inlet, who took the film that Macmillan had, that they had filmed in Pond in the late 40s and early 1950s. Um, and some of the photographs, she came down here and we went through the journals together. Um, and she made a beautiful film that is her and her, she worked with her mother who was, she was here, her mother was in Pond, of course. Um, but they created a, a lovely film called The Way I Picture It, that is their interpretation of these resources that Macmillan left behind. And I think that's the, the most exciting future for these 
uh, kinds of images. Macmillan, through his lectures, he educated a lot of people in the United States about his experiences in the Arctic. Um, and to him, that was a very important, uh, a very, really, really important part of his work, as was educating young men that he was taking into the Arctic. And for us, it's important now, I think, to make these things available so that the people in the communities can use them to educate their own children and talk to them about their, uh, their heritage in ways that we can't. We can facilitate it, but it's, it's really something that we hope that they will be taking a part in. Um, so that's, that's the kind of changing Arctic uh, that Macmillan witnessed. And now if you have questions, I'd love to take them. Um, Jesse, should I stop sharing my screen? Yeah, so I, I just removed it from the broadcast, so we're all good. You can do it, and then you can see us again, which makes yep. it more fun for you. Thank you so much for such a beautiful presentation. Uh, that was fantastic. And by the way, the only known instance of a rifle being used to fire holes in a sled in the history of exploring by the sea deer pants is five years. So thank you for that. Uh, that I'm told they still do that when need be. <laughs> no way. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a lot easier. When it's really cold, it's a lot better than trying to drill a hole. There you go. Well, we have quite a touch upon elements of that sort of thing, too. So we'll get to those in a minute. I just want to mention uh, over 65 people joining from Minnesota, Manitoba, Pennsylvania, Texas, Washington, California, BC, and Prague for good measure. So all over Canada in the States and internationally, thank you so much to all our, our folks for tuning in today. So we're going to dive in with a few questions. We've got about eight minutes, and then I'll make sure that you guys have a chance to find out ways you can share more questions with Genevieve and the Arctic Institute as well after the fact. So let's start with this one from from Miss Rapone's class. Uh, they want to highlight this at the bottom. You can see this. Did Macmillan collect data and stories from the native people themselves? Do scientists coordinate with native peoples nowadays in their research? So, yes, those are very good questions. And yes, Macmillan did collect data and stories. He didn't, he he wasn't so interested. A lot of a lot of what we think about um, with anthropologists is them collecting myths and legends and things like that. And he recorded some of those, but that wasn't his main interest. He was more interested in how they made a living and, and how they did things. And so he, his documentation was a lot about that. Um, other people had been in those communities and recorded their stories, so they have been recorded. It just, so it wasn't really all that necessary for him. He recorded the language and things like that as well. Um, and as to whether people coordinate with local communities, yes, now, it would really be impossible to work in the north without consulting with the community first. You don't, you can't just waltz into a town and say, "Oh, I want to research you." Um, you have to establish a relationship. You have to show them that what you're doing is going to be of value to them. Um, uh, it has to be, in a sense, collaborative. And more and more people are are trying to do what we would call community-driven research. That is doing research that they want done as opposed to the research that we might want done. Yeah, fantastic. And that's the sort of thing that we're really hoping to cover in this series of the Arctic Institute of North America. We're gonna be, that, that question, sort of the, the foundation that we're gonna be talking about a lot in the coming months. So I'm really glad that got asked, fantastic yeah. guys. Yeah. All right, uh, I, you sort of answered this to an extent, but I wanna cover it because I think it's really nice. It's one of our, our Arctic Institute uh, folks on, on their YouTube channel today, uh, sharing a question. Is there much a living? Is there much of a living memory of the Macmillans in the Bodun in the Kanak area today from Matt Walls at the UFC? Well, hello, Matt. <laughs> um, there is, I, to be honest, there is some, I think it's diminishing. There's not, there are very few people alive now who would have actually remembered his visits. Um, I worked most closely there with Navarana Javiak, who's, she's, oh, she's probably 70 something now. And she was a very small child the last time he visited. Um, so people remember, I think there are people who remember their parents talking about him um, to some extent. And certainly in Labrador, people also remember him. Uh, you know, some of the elderly people definitely remember him coming. Um, yeah. And they've been told stories as well by their parents. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for the question, guys. All right. Uh, let's take one from Doug Stern, who uh, he, he mentions that he met you at Tank Rafier years ago. Yes. Um, has any research been done at Crane City? So more of a technical question, uh, but if you want to give that a shot, that would be fantastic. <laughs> 
Um, Doug, I believe, um, and I, her name is going to escape me right now. I'll, I can email it to you if you like later. Uh, Parks Canada in the 70s did a big research project documenting historic sites all across the Arctic, not necessarily in parks, which there weren't any parks up there at the time. And yes, they did go to Cape Crane, Camp Crane. Uh, okay. There's not a lot there, but they went, yeah. Fantastic, great question, guys. All right, uh, there's sort of a joint double question back when you are showing the amazing hunting video earlier in the, in the talk. And again, we've never had anything like that in our broadcast. I know the Arctic Institute uh, team and, and people tuning in on your YouTube channel might be used to it. It's really exciting to share historical footage like that, so thanks so much. Um, so people wanted to know where that was shot and what season, time of year the hare hunting video was taken. So that was in the spring, I think think April or May we know the exact days we have it in Macmillan's journal I just can't remember the exact date uh, off the top of my head but the spring of 1915 and it was at Ita that's where their base camp was so that's on Fuk Fjord in northwestern Greenland uh, it's easy to find Ita on a map because even though it's been essentially abandoned for many many years it was important enough it got into the collective memory of map makers in in the south, I think, because so many explorers spent time there, so it still shows up sometimes on maps. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Genevieve. By the way, uh, the YouTube channel for Aina is having this great conversation, highlighting some of the things you're talking about. So <laughs> thanks to all the, the really keen and intelligent people there. That's great. Um, well, I'm going to take one more question before we dive in with a little bit more about how people can learn more about what you're doing. Uh, so, D. O'Brien, love the talk, and wants to know if you have any books to suggest about Donald McMillan or Arctic explorers for the layperson. So um, there are two biographies of Donald McMillan. One out of, both of them I think are out of print right now. One of them was written during his lifetime. It's called Arctic Odyssey by Everett Allen. And you'd have to get it from a library used bookstore. Um, there's also, a, because I know there are some classes listening to this. There's a, a book that was written much more recently called Captain Mac. And that is a middle school aimed biography of Donald McMillan um, by a, an author named Mary Cowan. And I know it's out of print, but it's in many school libraries, I imagine. So you might still be able to find a copy of it one way or another. And I have to say, I worked with Mary a little bit on the book and it's, you know, it's a very thorough, detailed biography of him. So it's, you know, it's written, it's very accessible because it's written for middle school kids, but I think even adults can get still get quite a lot out of it. Fantastic, that's often the way. Great kids books can appeal to a wide audience. There's some great graphic novels coming out. And while yeah. I don't know Donald McMillan stories personally, I can say Dead Reckoning by Ken McGugan uh, was a fantastic book, particularly highlighting indigenous communities linking with Arctic explorers. And yeah. Erebus by Michael Palin, another fantastic, great, yeah. really, really beautiful book. Um, Genevieve, this has been fantastic. But I, I, again, we're, we have more questions than we could possibly answer in a one-hour session. So where can we send people to learn more about your work, uh, the college, Arctic Institute, and more? Right. So obviously you you can check for, you can get some information from our webpage, which now you can see a, a banner on the bottom of the screen at the bowden.edu Arctic Museum. Um, and there's lots of resources there. You can stream the Muskox film and a whole, uh, the way I picture it, a whole bunch of films are available there for screening. Um, we'd love it if you'd come and look at them. There's also, you can search through our collections of, not all of our collections are online yet, but many of them are. Um, and if you really want, you have a direct question, you feel free to email me. Um, there's my address right there, glamoyne at bowden.edu. And I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. It depends on how many <laughs> emails you send me. But, uh, but, yeah. 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 The biggest problem with these sessions is that we give out emails and we give out these connections and then people are just absolutely inundated. But that is a great problem to have and we love that sort of curiosity. So we hope that uh, people do and we'd love to hear about it if, if you do get that slew of messages. Uh, Genevieve, this has been great. Uh, thank you so, so much for such a beautiful talk today. Uh, I also want to take the chance, again, this is part of our, the beginning of our series with the Arctic Institute of North America. So you can check that out in the bottom of your screen as well. They've got some amazing resources, uh, great projects to learn. Uh, and then again, I'll bring up the Arctic Museum webpage. You can check that out. There's some amazing digital exp uh, exhibitions, uh, some photography of Don McMillan and more. So I encourage you to learn more and keep the excitement going. Genevieve, thank you so much for such a, a lovely talk and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Well, thank you and thanks for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Awesome. Well, have a nice